Now, you have to use the premise, well, do you believe in OIH? Because there are folks who don't believe in it, okay? And it's controversial. There are some people who have done studies, pretty highfalutin pain doctors who have said, no, it doesn't exist. Yet there also have been studies that kind of prove it does exist. I believe it exists. So what is it? It's when a patient uses an opioid and over time develops more than tolerance, but super tolerance. Tolerance is normal. You take a medicine, your body adjusts to that dose. The side effects will usually go away. And you might need more medicine over time, stretched out over a long period of time, to achieve the desired effect. Opioid-induced hyperalgesia, or OIH, is different. Not only is there tolerance, but there's actually an anti-nociceptive effect. In other words, the pain medicines that you take actually create more pain. There's an imbalance. Homeostasis is no longer uh, the functional term. It's allostasis. It's an opponent's process. The more medicine you take for pain, a profound analgesic uh, therapy, the more the anti-analgesic process continues. And that's the theory behind opioid-induced hyperalgesia. So someone shows up to the primary care clinic, they're taking a fairly large dose, moderate to high dose of opioids, and they say, I still hurt. Not only do I hurt, but I hurt all over. And the physician's a bit curious about this because these medicines are supposed to stop pain, not make it worse. And when they do an exam, they'll find people often who have psychiatric comorbidity, but typically they'll find people who have diffuse pain, which is worse with stimulation. In other words, they have hyperalgesia. A painful response for me is much worse for a hyperalgesic patient. So these patients are notoriously intolerant of needle injections, surgical procedures, or any type of noxious stimuli that you might do, even, a, even an aggressive physical examination. And it's due to the opioids. Okay? It's not due to an underlying process. Um, when you reverse the opioids, you bring the opioids down, typically what you'll see is that this phenomena will regress and disappear. You can treat it with other medicines. You can detoxify patients. There's a whole host of varieties that primary care physicians, it's, it's probably kind of out of their wheelhouse because it's a complicated issue. But at least if they recognize somebody on a lot of opioids who still has persistent pain, a diffuse pain, pain which has gone beyond their original pain, say they had knee pain, now it's leg, back, and neck pain and headaches, they should consider OAH as a diagnosis. The easiest thing for them to do is to re wean the patient reduce the patient. The problem with that, and we find this in our practice, is it doesn't always work immediately. In other words, somebody could be on this level of opioids. When they get to this level, they'll feel better. But, but, but by the time they get there, as you reduce the opioids, they're having more and more pain. So they're really frustrated. And we found, especially with high-dose opioid patients, it, you know, weaning them takes a long time. They have to come in for several visits. We're trying to write different opioid doses. It's cumbersome. Uh, but a primary care physician could certainly do that. That's well within their uh, training to wean someone off a of medicine. And there are various uh, algorithms to do that. When it comes to adding adjuvants and NMDA receptor antagonists and maybe detoxification, I think that gets out of their uh, realm. I don't think many primary cares would be particularly comfortable with that unless they are really doing a lot of pain management. When to refer? Um, well, uh, that's um, it, it really depends on the level of comfort that the primary care has. There are primary care physicians that know how to manage pain pretty well. Um, if they're going to seek an intervention, and that's certainly not, and that's something that they don't have the ability to do, then certainly that's a time for referral. Then knowing the diagnosis or knowing when to send to an interventional pain physician is also important. Um, you know, they don't want to. I don't. If I was a primary care physician, I wouldn't want to find myself really enveloped with a very complicated patient with ultimate, ultimately with other comorbidities, perhaps a co coexisting substance use disorder. I think, you know, I have enough on my plate to treating 
heart disease and lung disease and other diseases, pain patients are notoriously complex and they are probably the most difficult patients you're going to see. Uh, and because the, sim the, the pain is not just a symptom, it's a disease, and figuring out when it's a symptom versus disease can be difficult. So in, in general, I think it's really up to them and you know how comfortable they are with the referral patterns. I will add that if they are using opioid medicines and they are somewhat comfortable but up to a limit, I think in my opinion, my opinion is that anyone who's on opioids for more than 30 days for a chronic condition, in other words, not that they're going to surgery or anything, they probably should get a second opinion with a pain specialist. I think from a medical legal point of view, that's prudent. And for the patient, it's prudent.